The following interview was conducted with Donita Stobel Gross for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, August the 15th, 2008 in Stewart Center by phone. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us where you were born, when, and parents and siblings in early years. Well, I was born in Indiana in a little town called Centerville. And it actually happened to be um, on this day a number of years ago. Happy and birthday. Happy birthday, right? <laughs> Thank you. And um, I had an older brother who was about five and a half years older. His name was Max. My parents uh, were Frank and Opal Stobaugh, and they were both natives of that part of the state of Indiana. And uh, I had grandparents that weren't too far away, so and an uncle and aunt with lots of cousins. So it was kind of a, a nice growing up time as a youngster, as I recall. Did I remember all those right? Is there anything else? What about uh, early schooling and then go on from there to high school? What was okay. next? Okay, my early schooling was in uh, Fort Wayne schools. I went to a public high or public grade school that uh, started with a kindergarten, and I can still remember the names of some of those teachers because I thought it was, they were so good. And uh, then when we were, uh, when I was in the close to junior high school, um, we moved. Well, let me back up. Um, we left Centerville and moved to Fort Wayne where my father took employment and it was there that I attended uh, early elementary school. And then when it got time for me to enter junior high school, that was kind of at the end of the, of the war or in the middle of it, and we moved to Indianapolis. And there I finished junior high and I had three years of high school and we moved again to back in the area where I was born to a town called Cambridge City, Indiana. And I completed my final year of high school there, um, which was Lincoln High School in, in Cambridge. I don't mind giving you dates. If, you, if dates are important, I can do that. But it's, it's up to you, whatever you feel comfortable with. All right. Uh, then co I, would college be next, or do you want to send I was fortunate enough when I was in high school to be awarded a um, Indiana State Congress of Parents and Teachers scholarship and also a, a state scholarship that um, pretty much took care of the essentials. And that was um, a very nice thing to happen to me and also my parents were very grateful because it was not necessarily going to be an easy time for them. So I went to Ball State and um, at first I decided that I would major in um, minor in music. I had been playing the piano and had been active musically all through uh, little grades and did recitals and all that kind of thing. And then when I went to uh, Ball State, I thought I'd really like to, you know, I, I feel guilty if I don't do something with my music, but I'd like to do something else. So I decided I would have a social studies major and a music minor. And that was fine, except um, my best grades were all in my music courses, and I was enjoying them more. <laughs> so I switched, and I ended up with uh, a special emphasis in music and uh, got the bachelor's degree in music education with uh, a minor in English and journalism. Okay. Tell us a bit about campus life. Did you, you, did you live on campus and any activities you were involved in in addition to music? At Ball State? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Um, Good. I had... Um, of course, because music then did become very important, I, I was very active in, in those organizations. In addition to that, I worked um, in the residence halls part-time, and I continued to do that for several years. I also worked in the music department. I was active in uh, journalism activities. I was on the staff of the Ball State News, I think, at one time. and. Um, trying to remember if there was anything else significant. I guess the, the music took so much of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, occasionally I was in a play or a light opera, and then I did a, a two other friends and I formed a, a trio. I was the pianist, and I had a violinist and a cellist, and we played trios. Uh, we entertained outside. And I sang in church choirs. I became very ecumenical in my, my religious activities because I sang in all kinds of different church choirs. Okay. Uh, what was the campus like in those days, and what size okay, was the enrollment? The campus life of Ball State was, uh, you know, really probably very uh, cho choice. Uh, it was a time when the veterans were coming back, so it was a very diverse 
group of students. Ball State was essentially pretty much from that part of the country or the state. And so having uh, veterans come back in and who were not always just local people was good. And also the, the faculty uh, had been out, some of them in the, in the military, and they mm -hmm. came back. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, it, was, it was interesting to have that kind of, of approach uh, to class work and so forth with the presence of these people. The other thing that I think was fun, uh, I was at Ball State when it had its um, second president, uh, John R. Emmons, and he was a, a wonderful uh, personality, and he cared for that school, and he was very dynamic. We had the leaf rakes, um, you know, we'd have the German bands, and we'd all meet out in the fall and rake leaves on the campus, and, and it was just, you know, a lot of the things that you associated with times when you could do that, and it was small enough. I think the campus, uh, the, the enrollment at that, that time was probably somewhere around 5,000, 5,200, something of that kind. Okay. Good. What year did you graduate, and then you went on for the master's right after that? No, oh. I graduated in 1950, mm -hmm. and then I uh, took a teaching job in Griffith, Indiana, which is up in the, the region, as we called it, and we weren't far from Hammond and Gary and also Chicago, for that matter. And my job there was to teach uh, vocal music, grades one through eight, and then also I had two or three choral groups in junior high and high school. And um, in fact, it's kind of interesting that we're talking about that era because in another month, one of the uh, classes that I was with there for three years is having their 55th high school reunion. And uh, I and the, there are two other teachers who are still living and we're going to join them. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And, and I uncovered in my <laughs> my clutter uh, this summer uh, some tapes of concerts that we had given. So uh, I found somebody who can put those on CD, and I'm going to take those down. And anybody who wants a copy can, but I think we'll just play some of them and let them hear how they sounded when they were high school. Sounds good. OK. Um, now let's talk, you got your master's. Talk about the, your career path before you came to Purdue and on that, how you happened to come to Purdue University. Okay. Um, I was a little bit, after those three years, I, I was a little bit um, determined that if I were going to continue in music that I should be the best music teacher there could be. And so I thought that should mean going um, for a master's degree in music. Um, also, so I could include a little bit of a vacation also, and it wasn't that bad as far as the school is concerned, I decided to go to summer school at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And uh, while I was out there and taking um, graduate courses in music and statistics and what have you, it seemed to me that my interests um, were not as allied with the interests of the music majors as I felt maybe they should be. Um, that group of students kind of seemed to want to eat, sleep, breathe, and do nothing but music. And I kind of yearned for a more diverse kind of um, application, I guess, of my talents or my abilities. So when I went back home after that summer, I took a year out and just uh, worked in industry, actually, um, doing secretarial work until I could get the thing squared away. And so then um, I had a call from Ball State and they said, uh, we need a residence hall director. And so if you would be willing to uh, consider that, come up and we'll talk. Well, I had had that experience uh, living in residence halls, and I'd also been what they called student staff my senior year, which gave me some insight as to how you, how you run things and the overall look. So I went up there, and I stayed at Ball State um, trying to figure probably one, four, or four years, I can't remember exactly, and then I started, to, I started taking classes to finish my master's, and uh, I finished that, took, took a year out uh, of the dorms, and was acting director of women's housing for a year, and finished my master's in counseling and guidance. And my, my thought at that time was that uh, Ball State had a wonderfully staffed Dean, or not Dean, but they called them directors of women's activities and so forth. But I kind of had met through my professional contacts people who were actually deans of women and deans of men. And I thought, 
I'd really like to work, you know, where that is the framework. So I wrote to the Big Ten schools. Uh, I wasn't particularly interested in going that far away, but I wrote to the Big Ten schools where I knew those uh, offices existed. And I had a very nice response from two or three of them, but uh, Helen Schleeman asked me to come for an interview, and I did. And I was so impressed, not only with her, but with the rest of the staff, that when a job offer followed, it didn't take me too long to accept. I was just very excited about mm -hmm. it. So. Good. And that's, that's how, how and what year was this now you came to Purdue? Right. What year was this, Janita? That would probably be, I think, around 1962. Okay. And then tell us a little bit about what your, when, what your duties were there in okay. the. Okay. Um, when I went to that office, at that time, they were, uh, in addition to counseling students in a general sense, and we, they also sponsored, served as sponsors for student organizations, I think their primary thought was, um, how can we help women develop and become the best that they can become? So that was an emphasis when I went there, it was um, on programs for women to assist them in, in this part of their life any way possible. I remember one of the things that we did for freshman women um, that was really, it was clever. Uh, a couple of the staff members put together a slide presentation which uh, took advertisements that were in magazines or in any other kind of printed form that they could duplicate and then there was a, a commentary along with it. But in essence, this was trying to help the freshman women see how they were being depicted and how marketing was trying to really put them in a position of just being kind of things and um, something to look at, something nice to smell, you know, all of those goodies. So that was uh, kind of an earmark of that first year when I was there that we tried to do that. Um, I think it was an interesting time because it wasn't long after that before Betty Friedan's um, emergence as a you know, the women role. Uh, her book was a uh, bestseller for a lot of people. And it was a time of, uh, I think, not necessarily conflict, but confusion. And I think so many things were being opened up for women that they, they you know, in other words, the world was kind of their oyster. Um, for my own role, I was an advisor um, to Green Guard and Gold Peppers, and I was a house advisor for Twin Pines. and. Uh, worked with the Associated Women Students. I served as a faculty fellow for at Fowler Court, and uh, we had responsibilities too. There was another staff member who was really primarily the one who worked with the Greek groups. Bev Stone uh, and I think Barb Cook were primarily the ones who worked with Mortarboard at first. Later, we all had an opportunity to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, I think. The other part that I enjoyed and how it kind of led to another part of my career was that Barbara Cook at the time was in charge of placement for women and also part-time employment for women. And it was an effort, we had to make a special effort to, so that they would come in. But primarily at that time it was mostly the home economics students. There were a few women in agriculture and as I recall, Dean Fendler was, was very, very um, protective of his <laughs> graduates and he didn't, he didn't care about them going someplace else. He thought there was enough jobs right there where he was that they should come. But eventually that all worked out and um, I got very much interested in, in the employment uh, function and enjoyed that aspect of the job very much. I kind of served as a backup to Barbara Cook and then pretty much handled the part-time employment mm -hmm. alone. Uh, for, for the research, I want to clarify that the placement for women operated at that time out of the Dean of Women's Office, is that correct? That's correct. The, uh, uh, as it exists today with placement was different at, the, at that time. It was. Okay. However, I should add that there were women who had, you know, there were a few women who were science majors. I don't remember if there were very many, if how many there might have been in engineering, but, you know, you had your chemistry and your math. and. Um, there were some of those people who did make it over to the university placement service where technically, it was, I don't remember now if it was called the men's placement office or not, but it might have been. Mm -hmm. okay. So they were allowed to do that. It's just that there were so few of them 
that um, if they came to us, we would suggest that they go there because primarily our people were people like Procter & Gamble or utility companies and wanting home economics. Too. Sure. Okay, good. Then uh, we moved to, uh, and I went, in, went to the placement office, which for researchers is now known as the Center for Career Opportunities. Okay. <laughs> Center for Career Opportunities. I yeah, like that. Yeah, that, that's CCO. It's a mouthful, but <laughs> it probably uh, is, is a better picture for it. Um, Lynn Kaysen, who had been the director of that uh, men's placement office, retired, and Dick Stewart was then named as his replacement. Dick had handled um, part-time employment for men before that in that office, and so when he was named director, he asked if I would be interested in coming over there and continuing to work with the uh, part-time employment for women, but at, by that time, this was in the middle of the 60s, and there were um, many calls from employers by that time that they really wanted to hire women. You know, that was the push. So he said, I'd need somebody to come in and not only uh, counsel women and help them with employment, but to set up programs so that we can encourage them not only to get in here, but in any way to make it possible for employers and students to get together. Okay. So Don't you, let me interrupt for a minute. Uh, for the research, part-time employment, when we think of it today, quite often we're talking about students, but part-time employment for grad for the students, was that for graduates? Is that what your part-time employment, say, for the men or women that you no. were involved with? No, this oh. would be like, you know, a professor would want somebody to come over and... Um, so it could be student, it would be employment on campus? Yes. Okay, go yes. ahead. Thank you. we might get, you know, somebody might find we're there and we might get a you know, somebody off campus that was asking for something, but as I recall, it was pretty much Camp, for campus. campus. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, go ahead. So you um, got over to the placement then. Yeah, and I think the um, one of the first things we did there, of course, was try to learn as much as we could about what the opportunities were that these employers were trying to fill. So. You know, my day could be filled with um, appointments with people who were coming there and simply they just wanted to tell me what they were looking for and asking for any guidance, any help that I could be in terms of helping that word get out and then also directing people who might have the skills that they were looking for to sign up for their interview schedule. Okay. So that was, um, that was kind of the, the easy thing and the first thing to do. Then. I started a, um, a follow-up uh, survey of our women graduates and trying to find out how many of them had found jobs and what their majors were and who they went with and that kind of thing so it, it could become a part of our, our report for the annual report. And um, it seemed to me that we're, we were beginning to get a number of alums who had been on their jobs for two or three years. and so they would be, I felt, a wonderful resource. So uh, we started, I started this um, function called Occupational Outlook. And we first called, I think it was in 1970s, but we called it 007, 007. Mm -hmm. And it's probably, you know, a little James Bond play on that. But what we would do uh, is invite, uh, I contact the alums, explain to them what our format would be which was essentially having them come back to campus, um, meet as maybe a panel, and discuss what they were doing with the kind of major they had, and then we would informally also ask them to meet with students and talk about any suggestions that they would have, or, and the students could ask them questions, you know, what it was like, or you know, what was it like when you went into that place? Was it really like they said it would be, or are you, do you like what you're doing, or whatever? So it was a, uh, a good exchange and an opportunity for uh, the young women who were still looking for jobs or who were approaching that time to get some firsthand information. So that, that was how that started. And then it expanded a little bit. We started um, having employers come uh, kind of either on that same day or the next day and they could kind of continue that same um, mood and follow up with some interviews with employers. This went on, as I understand it, uh, of course, it, it, I left in, what, 72, I think, or three, 
it went on for a few years, but then I guess the, <laughs> the men's students said, hey, this is a good idea. Why can't we be involved? So I personally haven't talked with anybody who was that involved at the time, but that's what I understand, that it, it remained, but it grew, and it eventually evolved so that it was for men and women students. So, and I'm sure that you know, there were some things that were changed about it. Mm -hmm. okay. But it was, a, it was a first start. Good. Did uh, during that time did, were there any uh, such things as career fairs or job fairs? Well, this would come the at that time that would come the closest to it, and I think that was the outgrowth probably of this when okay. this started. Okay. Because that's that's the way it, yeah it it had to have gone that way. I don't know if if um, Dick Stewart talked to that point or not, but mm -hmm. he would probably be a little more uh, on top of that okay. than I would right now. But I think that that happened. What was camp? What was the camp? You know, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Employers were always glad they would come. Sometimes, you know, stay for more than just the day they interviewed, and so they would come in and say, you know, if you've got a group of students, and they would like to um, have us talk about the interview process, or you know, anything else, um, we'll be glad to do that. You know, they were very anxious to have a um, a dialogue. Right, and also a presence. You mm -hmm. know, that they could, somebody say, well, you know, the guy from IBM said this, or Procter & Gamble, or whatever. Sure. So, that, that took place. What? And I think the faculty members, um, they were, you know, they had to learn a little bit, too, because they were getting these women students, and most of the women students in the traditionally male fields were, I shouldn't say all, but I think a good many of them were very bright and did very well. So, they wanted to be able to refer their best students you know, and sometimes they knew as much uh, about what the jobs were like at a certain industry as, uh, as anybody. So it was it was a kind of a blend of faculty and staff and and uh, the students and the employers. Okay. What was what was the campus like at that time? Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, I think it was probably one of the I wouldn't trade that for anything. It was the most interesting time to be on the campus. Um, you know, it was a time of student unrest. I, I do feel that uh, we would read about other Big Ten universities and certain things that were going on there, and it's, I know we used to talk about it a little bit among ourselves, that, that we thought eventually, you know, Purdue students would, would probably voice their opinions at some point, but they were never that, they were a little more cautious about just creating any kind of a, an uproar. But I remember that students used to gather under the mural in uh, the student, building, or is it, what was it called, Hibble in the Hall? The, the land grant mural? Yeah. That's in the Stewart Center. Yeah, Stewart Center, okay. They used to gather under there if they had something that they wanted to get out to somebody. And uh, one time we had um, a representative from the Central Intelligence Agency, and he was a very unique individual, as it turned out. He was one of their overt employees, naturally, but he would have this name tag on, and it would say under it CIA in great big letters. And he would he would go out many times and stand under, not many, but they'd have those over the noon hour. So he would go out and he would just stand there and, and listen to what was going on and just enjoyed it. And one time he said that some student asked him if he was really from the CIA. And he said, no, that stands for the Cigar Institute of America. And he just, you know, kind of had uh, his own little, little joke about it. Um, <laughs> I think one of the other things, I remember sitting on the steps of Hubby Hall with a graduate student the evening that um, the students were gathering out in the parking lot behind that building. And I don't recall now what, what all happened, but it was the first time, to my knowledge, that the Indian State Police did make a presence on the campus. And as I said, I don't think there was any, I don't recall anybody really getting violent or hurt or anything of that kind, but it was just a totally different um, experience and atmosphere than you would normally expect to have. But um, Purdue students used to gather on the Oval uh, at no time, and I felt that our, our dean staff particularly was uh, very open and very willing to uh, deal with that kind of a, a representation of students, and I think uh, I think it was, you know, really pretty well done for the for the most part, mm -hmm. but there certainly were were challenges. Yeah. Uh, do you rem uh, can you recall Chauncey Village? What was that like? Uh, I'm sorry. Was Chauncey Village, the village there, or the bookstore? Yeah, you know, I can. 
Yeah, the village at, at the time that I was there uh, was just, that's what it was called, the village. And mm -hmm. I probably, <laughs> things I remember about that, um, that little hamburger place that's something on the level, but what is it at? Uh, the Triple X? Yeah, the Triple X. Still there. Is it still there? Correct. Yeah, and I always, I like, uh, I remember that place. And then, of course, the bookstores. And um, the other thing that um, comes to mind was that at that time they had a wonderful Chinese restaurant. And it was... Um, the Peking. That we like to take you know, people to, for mm -hmm. lunch and that sort of thing. Sure, right. Then when did, uh, then you left the university, what, in the early 70s? Yes. Oh, okay. And where, where did you go then? Well, the, um, the, in the placement function, we had a professional organization called the College Placement Association, College Placement Society, no, Midwest College Placement Association. And anyway, I was an officer in that. And, uh, we had, uh, the officers had a retreat in Wisconsin, and one of the other officers was a man from Kimberly Clark, who also happened to be there. And so he invited me to have dinner with him and his uh, young son, who had come with him. And um, among other things, he got around to the point that he wondered if I'd be interested in interviewing for a job that they had open for a corporate recruiter. And this was not an ideal time for anything, but because I think it was in August, and but I said yes, I would be willing and, and interested in interviewing. So I did that and um, ended up taking the job with Kimberly Clark. Didn't have very much um, time to prepare, and I felt very badly about having to give Dick Stewart such late notice. But he was totally. Um, you know, whatever I needed to do, and my thinking was that Dick was doing such a fine job at the uh, placement service that uh, his wife was on the faculty, and I thought, you know, his was the only job I'd probably really like to have, and I couldn't see that coming available, so I thought this was an opportunity I should take advantage of. So I moved to Wisconsin then in that, I guess, about 72, okay. and uh, started out with Kimberly Clark in, as a corporate recruiter. and. That was a good place to begin because it gave me an opportunity to learn about jobs in the corporation, and then also I went back to college campuses where I was very, very comfortable and sure. happy to be. Right. What about family? Can you tell us a little about your, the family? Are you, you married or? I did not marry. Oh. Um, had a I think looking back on it, I was I'm going through boxes of stuff now, and I I find things that make me think of certain periods of my life and. And I think, you know, I've, you know, I've really done a lot of things, and I feel very fortunate. And um, so I, I got beyond that point where people start asking you, well, you know, aren't you ever going to take the plunge or whatever? But um, when I moved to Wisconsin, I attended church, and there was about a period of time between 79 and 83 that my mother, who had still was still living in Cambridge City, my father had passed away in... Um, I guess he died in 69. Anyway, she called and said that um, she'd like to come up here and um, spend the winter because she didn't like being alone in that house all the time. So she came up, spent a couple of winters, although people thought she needed her head examined, but she was fun. And then later in 79, she moved up here and we bought a house and she lived with me. Um, we were longtime members of, happened to be the First Methodist Church here. And so I was involved there with uh, well, with board activities and singing and music. And uh, there was a lady in our uh, church who passed away, and her husband asked me if I would sing for her funeral. And I did, and that was just a very casual thing. I, I knew them, but I didn't know them well. And a few years later, my mother had passed away, and not two years later, sorry, she, she left the same year, but it was only, it was not until 1985, which was actually two years after we both lost loved ones, that uh, we started to date and go out, and I married him in later that year. And his name was Roy Gross, and he had been, um, well, he had an interesting background, but he, he was a fine person, and he, his last job was in banking. So we had 18 years together, and fortunately uh, we were able to, I had retired the next year early, so I could spend more time together. 
and we did a lot of traveling and uh, just just had a really wonderful time. Mm -hmm. And then he passed away about five years ago because of the cancer of the jaw. So mm -hmm. now I divide my time between Arizona in the, in the winter and Nina, Wisconsin in the summer. Sounds good. Um, you have a, uh, I haven't asked this, how about an out, any outstanding, an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us? Comes to mind? Mm -hmm. Or uh, some overall just closing comments which you, you would like to share? I should have thought of that. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm a, uh, I guess I would have to class myself as a people person and I've, I have, um, I have a child, he's, he's grown up now in Kenya that uh, we have been sponsoring for a number of years and it's been very, very gratifying to, to have that relationship and to keep in touch with him. Has he uh, visited you? Does he, has he come here? No, but oh. he wouldn't very much like to and I, I wouldn't be surprised if sometime I started to work on that a little bit because I'd love to have him, I'd love to give him that opportunity sure. if he could. How old is he? Well, he's 21 now, oh. so he would be uh, you know, old enough to travel and sure. that, that kind of thing. But well. he has a lot of younger brothers and sisters, so that, that's good. Okay. And then I think, um, you know, for, for this is really very wonderfully exciting, but, um, you know, when we traveled, sometimes we would meet people and, for example, they found out I played, so I'd end up playing the piano in, in like in the lobby of a hotel while we were waiting for a bus or something. and. Um, I sang, when we were at the Holy Land, I sang, I walked today where Jesus walked in the upper room. Um, and that, that song is, is one that's associated with the Easter period of time. And uh, I hadn't planned to do that, but my pastor's wife had brought some music and I didn't have accompaniment, but I didn't need it. But, but singing that uh, in that particular place um, was very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Very I, special. Yes, very special. Mm -hmm. And I've recorded, I recorded songs to be played at my mother's funeral, and I also recorded a song that was played at our wedding, because the person that I had uh, asked to sing at the last minute uh, was sick and not able to, so I, I did that. And so I think music has continued to play a very uh, important. I sing now with uh, three different groups down in Arizona, and. Uh, as far as a special thing, I, I was a little bit scared to try it, but there are four of us, three women and a man, and um, I'm singing with that group, and that's given me an opportunity to sing different kinds of music than just, you know, religious and traditional music. And so every time we do a program, and I have an opportunity to communicate with people with that, and as long as my voice holds out, um, you know, I, I'm just really thrilled to be able to do that. That sounds good. Danita, I want to thank you very much. It's been really wonderful for uh, the opportunity to interview you, and I hope we keep in touch. And if your travel brings you near Lafayette, you'll give me a call. I will certainly do that, okay. Catherine, and I thank you for being so patient with oh, me. Since we thank you. We were able to do this last week. Yes, we're fine, and you enjoy the rest of the summer and the fall as well. Okay, now are you, as I understand it, um, I, I don't know if we're still recording or not, but are you going to send me something that I get... You will get a transcript. That's right for you to review. Okay. Right. All right. And we'll okay. t and uh, then if you make any changes, we will we will adjust it accordingly. All right. Okay. And, uh, please add your comments too if you think there's some things that that need to be omitted. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.